His Truth Seekers ministry really encourages you to diligently study the Word. We want to really seek for truth, and you'll benefit the most from doing this on your own. We all get ideas from others and see and hear different things, but we should check everything out in the Word itself to see if what we hear and read from different sources is true and to confirm it in our own minds. So study for yourself. We should all aim to go by this verse in 2 Timothy, study to show thyself. Okay, it's you you're concerned about here. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are so many different ideas on so many theological topics. You can pick among any number of ideas or theories to believe or which preacher you will follow. But it is much better to come to your own conclusions through your own study. Then you can know that you have a reason for your belief. Last Tabernacles here, I shared a message about Bible study and explained the principle of letting the Bible define its own terms and explained a detailed way to do that. There are a number of Bible study methods I'd like to eventually talk about in detail, but I thought today I would share a little bit about some of the ways almost to not study it, some of the ways people study it incorrectly and get into theological problems. Basically, this is to help you avoid the pitfalls in Bible study. I originally had a title, Avoiding Scriptural Ditches and Potholes, but we decided that didn't sound so good. There are no ditches or potholes in Scripture. There are only the ones we make and fall into ourselves. So there will be references to ditches and potholes, but they are the theological ditches that we make ourselves. In the afternoon following Yeshua's resurrection, two disciples were walking along the road to Emmaus. Perhaps they were among the most discouraged of Yeshua's followers. Perhaps they were among the most lost of his little flock. So they were the ones he went to rescue. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Yeshua himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Yeshua wanted to encourage them and let them know about his resurrection. Why did he not just make himself known to them right away? Why instead did he give them a long explanation? It says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Why did he take the long scriptural route? I think the answer is that he wanted them to get their information from the word. That is why, after their explanation of why they were so sad, he did not reveal himself. Rather, he explained to them from the word what had happened. And the reaction was, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Why did their hearts burn? Because their eyes were opened, not to immediately recognize him, but to see the truth in scripture to have scriptures which they likely knew well explained and put together in a way that really made sense and explained about the Savior and his mission. And that must have been very exciting to them. The reason for their sadness in their, in their minds was that their master, teacher, and friend had died. But there's a sense in which their sadness came from not understanding and believing scripture. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. They were not understanding this. Had they understood the prophecies, they would have had cause for rejoicing, even if he hadn't appeared to them. Reasoning from Scripture, Yeshua could say, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? It was the opening of their understanding of Scripture before he had revealed himself that caused their hearts to burn within them. Notice they did not say, did not our hearts burn within us when we realized it was him. It was while they were having the scriptures explained to him. So Yeshua was careful to encourage them to believe because of what was written. 
We face the future when miracles will be easily counterfeited. We need to have our faith based firmly on Scripture. We also need to have our daily walk based in Scripture. How important it is that we understand it correctly. Just as Satan will work hard to present counterfeit miracles to get our confidence in something other than the Word, so he is now and will all along the way work hard to have us misunderstand Scripture. We are to walk the narrow way, and as we do, we want to avoid stumbling at the potholes in the way. I wouldn't want to stumble going up that path. So let's address some of those potential scriptural potholes and ditches. There are ways of looking at Scripture that can cause us to stumble, to misinterpret and misunderstand the message. I'm going to explore some of these and hopefully give you some tools to help in your study. There won't be time to go into all the items in great detail, so some I'll just mention briefly to bring them to your attention. And if you think they might be a factor in your study of Scripture, you may want to consider them further. And please, I'm not directing this against anyone. I might tread on some toes a little bit, but it's it's not meant to be a personal attack in any way. I have to remember to be aware of these pitfalls myself, and I'm still maybe climbing out of some of them. Okay, let's look at uh, confusion between faith and evidence. One problem people run into is that they confuse faith and evidence. Much of the Christian world does this. Just have faith, they will say. And that faith is often defined as belief without evidence. Many people understand faith that way, belief without evidence. So why include this? Why is this a problem? Because this is the very basis for our need to study for ourselves, that we can have evidence for our understanding of Scripture. Is this statement, God is love, is that a reason to follow God or even to love Him? Actually, it's not. Not on its own. God is love is merely a claim. God says He is love, but there's no evidence for it in that claim. And please don't misquote me. There is plenty of evidence that God is love, but there is none within that claim itself. Satan could claim, and has, that God is not love, that he is self-serving rather than putting others first, that he was trying to keep something from Adam and Eve. When God said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. When he said that, he was actually making another claim, that eating of the tree would result in death. And we know that Satan countered that pretty quickly by saying, ye shall not surely die. In essence, he was saying to Eve that God was lying to her. God could have responded by saying, yes, I am telling the truth. I am trustworthy. In fact, I am love itself. So you can see that we've really got uh, two opposing claims there. God wants us to have faith in him, but not blind faith. Faith should be based on evidence. Where is the evidence? For instance, that God is love. It is not in the claim. It is in what we know about God from other places in Scripture. It can also come from nature, from others, from our own experience. But most importantly, it needs to come from Scripture. Largely, in the case of God as love, it is from the stories, particularly those about His Son in the Gospels. The evidence that proves the claims in Scripture is largely in the stories, and we tend to give those to our children. You know, we give them the stories and we take the the claims and the statements. So as adults, we tend to concentrate on the claims and what we might call key texts. God wants us to go by evidence. So on that walk to Emmaus, Yeshua gave the evidence first from Scripture so that when he revealed himself, essentially when he made the claim, they would believe him based on scriptural evidence. Consider another example of evidence over faith given in Yeshua's reply to John the Baptist's disciples. 
And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Yeshua, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou that should come, or look we for another? Yeshua could have answered truthfully, Yes, I am he. But that would have only been a claim. Instead of doing that, he provided evidence. And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. He did all those works. And then he simply pointed to the evidence without even making the claim he certainly could have. Then Yeshua said, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard, how the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. He left it for John to make a decision based on the evidence reported to him. And what made that evidence to answer John's question was, of course, that a fulfilled prophecy. In Isaiah It says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. John's messengers weren't just given a claim. They saw the eyes of the blind opened. They saw that the deaf could hear, and the lame could walk again. They were given evidence Faith should be based on evidence. And you've probably all heard this, faith is believing what you know ain't so. Have you heard that? Well, is that faith, real faith, or is it only blind faith? Sorry, but that ain't biblical faith. It's not the type of faith God wants us to go by. He wants us to have faith or trust in him based on evidence. That is why there are so many stories and not just a lot of key texts and theological reasoning. That is part of the reason the Bible is as long as it is. He wants us to have lots of evidence. The whole great controversy will only be solved by an accumulation of evidence, the weight of evidence, as God shows how he is solving the problem of sin and how he wants to relate to people in contrast to Satan's ways. Think of another quick example. Abraham's obedience in regard to being told to sacrifice his son Isaac. Absolutely, that was an example of strong faith. But was it blind faith or was it based on evidence? Abraham was a friend of God. He knew by past acquaintance that God was trustworthy and that what he did and said would work out. Abraham believed God and God called him a friend. They were friends, and you can trust your friends. The word believed is pistio, I may not be pronouncing this right, which is from pistis, which is from pithio, meaning to persuade or trust. A lot of those words, uh, faith, trust, confidence, a lot of those come from the same root words. And here's another use of that word. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And that's from that same original Greek word. Again, I have included all of this because we need to study for ourselves, to gather all the evidence and not just go by long-held traditions and what others claim or tell us. Following this evidence-based approach, finding solid biblical reasons for what you believe will keep you out of many ditches. Now we'll consider some other hazards that can land us in a pothole or right in the ditch. Some are quite brief, and others I'll include more detail. We need to recognize that there are multiple possible meanings to many words, in some cases quite a few different ones. We need to be careful of the danger of choosing and emphasizing one meaning for such words to the exclusion of other possible meanings. There are many different understandings of timing issues because words such as day, night, evening, morning, etc. do have multiple meanings. Such words do need to be understood correctly in the context where they're used in a particular verse. 
without restricting the meanings to the one we think fits our theory. And that applies no matter what you believe. I have to go by this myself. We all do. So one pothole we could fall into would be that of restricting our understanding to one meaning for a word when there are other legitimate biblical meanings. This relates very closely to the meanings of words that I just mentioned and to what I shared in considerable detail last time, allowing the Bible to define its own terms so that we get the right meanings. I'll very briefly mention examples I've looked at in detail. In the Bible, words translated as forgiveness and sometimes remission come from original words with different meanings. There's a Greek word, charizomai, which describes forgiveness from the perspective of the one doing the forgiving. And I didn't put it on the slide, but a good verse for that is uh, Ephesians 4.32. It says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And that forgiven and, and forgiving in that verse is from the Greek word charizomai. So it's referring to the the forgiver, the father in this case, doing the forgiving. Then there is another Greek word, aphiomai, which describes forgiveness from the perspective of the one receiving the forgiveness. Forgiveness is, after all, a two-part or two-party transaction. It is both given and received. And a good verse for, for this one is um, 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that forgive is from the Greek word aphiomai. So if we confess, then we receive forgiveness. It is really helpful to understand that there are, we could say, two types of forgiveness, or better, two aspects to forgiveness. And I wrote about that in, in detail in this little booklet that goes through that. And here's another example of this that uses this uh, same principle. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, Romans 10.4. Does this mean that the law is done away with? Some people take it that way. The word end would seem at first to indicate that. Not using Bible definitions of the word has caused many to stumble over this. The original word translated end as telos, which is used in this verse to mean the goal of faith, uh, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. It is referring to the goal of faith. It is not saying that faith is coming to an end. We use the word end that way as well. And then look at these verses. In James 5, it says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. We have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of Yeshua. For Yeshua is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And here it is in a better translation. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and have see, seen the end intended by Yeshua, that Yeshua is very compassionate and merciful. It's not talking about Yeshua coming to an end. And in 1 Timothy 1.5, it says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. And again, here it is from a better translation. Now the purpose, rather than end, it says purpose. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. In these cases, the word can be better understood to mean goal or purpose, and it fits the context, the context in each case. Looking at the context of several uses of, a, of an original word can really help to clarify the meaning. So another way we could find ourselves in the ditch is by failing to use Bible definitions for words. If you want to understand the meaning of a verse or passage, what could be more fundamental than to correctly understand the meanings of the individual words? In fact, if you are wrong on the meanings of the words, you're going to go wrong on the verse, almost for sure. Now let's consider uh, two witnesses. Many people use this, and the idea is that any teaching, principle, or doctrine must have at least two witnesses, two mentions in Scripture. Of course, this is not a bad idea. We want to go by the weight of evidence, 
And if two or more passages are giving the same message, that is just more evidence. But the idea that there must always be two witnesses before we can accept something can be overused. What about someone early in history? Think back to the patriarchs when they first heard something. There was no second witness. When Abraham was told to go and sacrifice his son Isaac, did he excuse himself saying, I think I would like a second witness for that? When we talk about getting a second opinion from another doctor, what is implied is that we don't trust the diagnosis or opinion or witness of the first doctor. We are not confident that he is correct and would like a second witness. So again, I'm not saying that this is uh, not a good principle to use. We just need to be careful not to use it inappropriately. Here's another thought. When something is first mentioned in Scripture, the very first time, and it is being told to someone, was that not valid or trustworthy until it was repeated, until it was given a second time? Could Eve have excused her eating of the forbidden tree because no one else had warned her? Let's consider the verses that actually recommend two witnesses. In Deuteronomy 17, 6, it says, At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. And in Deuteronomy 19, it says, One witness shall not rise up against the man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. These verses are in the context of proving the charge of a sin against a person. It would be especially important in providing evidence to establish the truth of a charge that could result in the death penalty. You don't want to be pretty careful there. So if a person's sin was to be made public, there had better be good evidence. It is a very good principle designed in these verses, designed and given to protect the innocent. However, to take it out of that context and use it as some have, could be a misuse of Scripture. I've heard the charge made that the concept of the millennium is not valid because it does not appear except in one place, in Revelation 20. People claim there is no second witness, and on that basis ignore the chapter and its timeline for the events it describes. Actually, it also appears in Isaiah 24, not in as much detail But it is there when you carefully compare. Many of the aspects are there. So this idea of the need for two witnesses can be taken too far. People tend to use it to discount something they don't like. So be careful of this ditch. I change not. I have heard something like this. The wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming at the second coming, So they must be destroyed by the brightness of his coming at the third coming as well, because God does not change. Even if there is some truth to that, it is not a valid way to prove it. I would say that's a misuse of that principle of I change not. And we should understand that it is the Father who said, I change not. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And... uh, Bruce, I thank you for that that nice Bible that has the original words in it. So I checked on that, and it uh, says, For I, Yahweh, change not. So it's referring to the Father. I, Yahweh, change not. There is a sense in which the Son does change as he takes on different roles throughout salvation history. And of course, there are seven of them. Uh, He originally is the angel of his presence. He is a teacher, a prophet. A sacrifice, a priest, a judge, and a king. He does, takes all those roles. However, the I change not is talking primarily about character, not about roles. While God does not change in terms of his character, there are verses that speak of God repenting of something he did or planned to do. But it, it is always in the context of a change in man. Referring to the repentance of the people of Nineveh, in Jonah it says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. God reacts to our actions, but always within certain principles that have our best good in mind, 
and always consistently with the underlying principle that God is love. The change referred to in I change not is a reference to character, not to actions. His character does not change. His actions may change in reaction to a change in man precisely because his character does not change. He always does the loving thing. So be careful if you're going to quote I change not, that you're using it correctly. And here's another little pothole, uh, another verse that I've seen misused. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I have seen cases where this was quoted in opposition to something written on a spiritual topic where there is no actual scripture quoted or any verses referenced. So I've even done this. I've written a little thing to someone. I didn't actually quote any scripture. I just kind of explained something. And I got this comeback. There's no light in it. You didn't quote scripture. Well, I think that's a, a misuse again. The verse doesn't mean scripture must be quoted, but that the thoughts expressed should be consistent with scripture. Notice that it says, if they speak not according to this word, it does not say to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not by quoting this word, it is because there is no light in them. This reasoning can be used, and I've seen it used, to brush off otherwise good reasoning that is not agreeable simply on the basis of there being no actual scripture quoted. It is not a correct use of the verse. I believe that God does things and has set things up in an orderly manner. Here's a question. Why would God have created a year with 365 and a quarter days? Well, the answer is that he didn't. There's scriptural and even historical evidence pointing to an original year of 360 days with 12 30-day months. Now, wouldn't that make understanding the calendar a lot easier? I think it would. Obviously, things have changed. God's original creation has been marred in a great number of ways. When Paul was talking about behavior in the church, he said, let all things be done decently and in order. I believe he was expressing God's wish for the church to be patterned after how God himself would do things. Some have fallen into this ditch in taking the principle that God is a God of order to imagine things like that there must be an even number of weeks per year. That would be orderly, but uh, again, a misapplication. They are trying to impose the principle of orderliness on a system that is no longer functioning as God originally designed. Yes, God is a God of order, but there are a few things that have changed on this earth since he first created it, changes that have made the world more disorderly. And we're looking, of course, forward to the day when it will be made new and all orderly again. Here's another possible ditch, another ditch people can find themselves in, and that is failing to understand the concept of conditional prophecy. In Jeremiah it says, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. These verses speak specifically about nations rather than than individuals. They are pointing out the conditional nature of their standing with God. And the same principles are given elsewhere in Scripture. And they, and this is talking about Gentiles, they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of Yahweh, and ye shall know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass if ye will diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim. The first 15 verses of Deuteronomy 28 speak of promises and blessings for Israel as a nation but they also include key uses of the word if, again, clearly pointing out their conditional nature. 
And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that Yahweh your Elohim will set thee high, set thee on high above all nations of the earth. When we look for and expect them to happen, the promises to happen to a nation without checking to see whether the if has been fulfilled, we are potentially falling into a ditch or worse. We are veering off the road into a totally wrong direction that can have many implications for our understanding of scripture and even future fulfillment of prophecy. Whenever we see if then, we need to check the if before we can accept the then. We need to look to see if the conditions were fulfilled and come to a conclusion based on that. Back in the early 1980s, I was doing computer programming using a computer about the size of a fridge, a good sized fridge. And we often used flowcharts to work out the logic. And the procedure is really very simple. You need to first understand what the conditions are of the promises. And then usually we use a diamond shape for a, a, a choice. You know, you ask, were the conditions fulfilled? And then you proceed in the right direction based on the answer. Really very simple. Okay, here's something else, the concept of adding or removing words from Scripture. Sometimes people will object to an explanation of something in Scripture by saying, but that is adding to the word. And many times that objection, in terms of the actual words, may be right. However, it is important to understand what this means. We are told in Deuteronomy, ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim, which I command you. And in Proverbs, it says, Every word of Yahweh is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And here is maybe the strongest warning of that in Revelation. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these words, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The warnings in these verses are not simply warning about minor changes in wording. Think about it. Every version of the Bible is worded differently, or it wouldn't be a different version. The warning is not against changes that make the meaning more clear. It is warning against changes, additions, or omissions that change the meaning. It can actually be confusing or incorrect sometimes to not add a word. And I have a good example of that. In a ministry newsletter several months ago, I included a little quiz with some questions related to the feasts. You might recognize this from that newsletter if you got it. One of the questions, this one was kind of a tricky one. Passover occurs in the Hebrew month of what? Abib. Abib or Nisan. On which day of Nisan? Fourteen. Okay. I understand that there are some different understandings of timing, but I believe the Bible clearly teaches that Passover was on the 15th. And so many people said the 14th. Now, I've got, I'm going to publish an e-book on this, actually, with more detailed reasoning, but I'll just explain a bit about it. The 14th was the day on which the Passover lamb was killed, and preparation was made for the Passover meal. That was to happen in the evening of Nisan 15, before midnight, when in Egypt the actual passing over of the houses of the Israelites occurred. It was just like the sixth day of the week was the preparation for the seventh day Sabbath. So you've got the sixth day of the week before the seventh day of Sabbath, and you've got the day when the lamb was killed in preparation for the actual Passover observance. Actually, the Bible never uses the term Passover day or day of Passover. You won't find it. Uh, maybe some other versions might have put that in, but it's not there in the original. So it's not used, those terms, to specifically designate the day itself. The term Passover is often used as an adjective with a noun it is modifying, not being specified. 
In Mark 14, 12, it says, On the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And we have to understand that the terms Passover and unleavened bread were used basically interchangeably. If a person was to go through all 71 uses of the word Passover in the Bible and determine carefully from the context in each case what Passover is referring to, it will be seen that it never refers to Passover day or the day of Passover. In almost every case, a word needs to be added to clarify what Passover is referring to. And the correct word, depending on context, might be sacrifice or lamb or meal or feast or observance, and there might be a few others. I'm going to show just a few examples to show that the correct word must be added to show what Passover is referring to, and it's not the day. In Exodus 12, 21, Take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover day. No, it doesn't say the Passover day. They're killing the Passover lamb. This is the ordinance of the Passover day. No, it's the Passover meal. Because right after it says, There shall no stranger eat thereof. It's eating of the Passover meal. Neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left unto the morning. It's referring there to the Passover sacrifice. In Luke 22, Yeshua said, I have desired to eat this Passover. It wasn't Passover day. He desired to eat the Passover meal with them before he was going to suffer. The point here is to show that it is actually sometimes necessary to add a word to clarify scripture. So be careful about quoting the verse about adding or removing words. Make sure you're using it correctly. Sometimes taking scripture too literally can be a problem. We need to ask not just what does it say, but also what does it mean, and how does it affect my life? We need to apply scripture to our own lives. The most obvious thing to do is to take it just as it reads, but be alert for clues that it may mean something else or that there may be a hidden or additional meaning below the surface. Sometimes we are told directly that a passage is a a parable, and that is a story with a meaning that's a little bit hidden. If you want to determine the meaning of a passage, isn't it good to know the meaning of the individual words? This goes back to the principle of letting the Bible define its own terms. People sometimes overuse this saying, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. I mean, that sounds really good in principle, but it can sometimes be used as an excuse for laziness, for not wanting to make the effort and take the time to really dig into Scripture. Sometimes the meaning is not apparent on the surface, and we have to investigate more closely. We need to ask not only what does it say, but what does it mean? Think of the state of the dead, uh, many parables. We should fear to only scratch the surface of Scripture, and we need to dig deeply to find the treasure And there's even a parable teaching that principle. This also relates to the concept of blind faith as opposed to evidence that we talked about earlier. People also like to quote a little Latin phrase, sola scriptura, the idea of using scripture only. And sometimes they use it for using scripture with no place even for reasoning. They don't realize that it was Luther who came up with that phrase in regard to a specific situation. He was dealing with the church's sale of indulgences and that sort of thing, and he came up with that term. Actually, in Luther's mind, Scripture did not include even the books of Hebrews, James, Jude, or Revelation. He basically rejected those books. There can also be reasoning involved in our understanding of spiritual matters. So we can use reasoning. We're told in Isaiah 1, Come now and let us reason together, saith Yahweh. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Scripture is reasonable. People will sometimes make the charge that a line of reasoning, a thread of logic, is only human reasoning. Well, actually, we are called upon to use our reason, and human reasoning is the only kind of reasoning we can do. There is nothing wrong with reasoning if it's based on Scripture. Now here's maybe a bit harder one. 
overemphasis of the Torah, okay? Many people will put a very heavy emphasis on the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. These books are very important, no doubt about it. However, let's remember that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And what I'm going to say is simply meant to help keep the emphasis in proper balance. Please don't misunderstand. I'm in no way saying the Torah, the first five books written by Moses, are not important. But is the Torah, or even let's say the Old Testament, meant to explain the New Testament? Or is it the other way around? As we compare Scripture with Scripture, I think we'll find some of each. But let's remember that light and understanding is progressive. God is trying to lead us to a better knowledge of him and his plans for this world and for us. There certainly are examples of the New Testament explaining or clarifying the Old Testament or giving more light, and there's plenty the other way. It works both ways. In Matthew 19, Yeshua said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, and he goes on to explain that. So he's explaining something a little more clearly perhaps, Uh, than was given in the Old Testament, or something closer to God's ideal. A case of polygamy. There are indications in the New Testament that monogamy is the ideal. And of course, we wouldn't go looking for a second wife today. In Timothy, it says, Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. If a man have two wives... One beloved and the other hated. It goes on to how to treat them, but it says if a man have two wives in the Old Testament. Yet polygamy was allowed, or at least tolerated, in Old Testament times. And forgiveness. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Yeshua actually did not disagree with them in their quoting the Old Testament. Moses did command that. However, something more was revealed than how Yeshua dealt with the situation. That point could probably lead to a big debate, but I'm just trying to make a point that the New Testament explains the Old in many cases. Yeshua taught that obedience to the law of God was more than outward compliance. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. The Torah seems to deal more with outward actions, and Yeshua made it more a matter of the heart. The word and law of God is not meant to refer to outward actions only. We're told in Hebrews, for the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Are there cases where we could argue that the Old Testament or the Torah explains the New Testament? No doubt about it. But I found these examples to make a particular point. The point is that we need to take the whole book. Should the New Testament agree with the Old Testament? Should it agree with the Torah? Yes, of course. Should the Torah agree with the New Testament? I believe it should. We need to take Scripture as a whole while realizing that God is always working with us where we are and attempting to lead us to a better knowledge of Him and His ways. And let me just show you how far a wrong emphasis can go. And I'm going to show material exactly as given by one popular online teacher. And these are, it might be a little hard to read, but those are basically screenshots. I didn't transcribe this or anything. Uh, directly from this website. He presents Matthew twenty six seventeen, And on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you desire that we prepare for you to eat the Passover? And then he says about that, This verse is obviously incorrect. For if it was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, then the Passover would already have passed, having been eaten the night before. 
See, he is missing the understanding that the Passover observance, not the sacrifice, but the observance, happens on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then he says, something is amiss here. Uh Uh-oh. Am I really saying that your Bible has it recorded incorrectly here? Yes, I am. We have just proven it to you. But next, they will quote to you what Paul says in the book of Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And going on on his website again, the word for scriptures here is graphe, and he gives some details about it. This word is referring to the only scriptures that Paul and Timothy had. Those were the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeshua himself tells us what they are in Luke. He tells us, this, he tells us the scriptures are specifically the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he includes Luke 20, 24, 44. And he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. The writings of Matthew were not considered part of the scriptures, nor was any of the New Testament. If the New Testament does not agree with the Torah of the Old Testament, then it is the New Testament that is wrong. Well, of course... Matthew had not yet written his gospel. None of the New Testament was written. The author of this website is using reasoning from the New Testament, which he says is wrong, to say that the New Testament is wrong. A good example of circular reasoning. A deep ditch indeed, I would say. Some people have taken this even further. I was corresponded a bit with Eric Bissell, and he shared with me that down in California, there's some that have emphasized the Torah in such a way as to reject the Messiah altogether. Yet scripture, including the Old Testament, is very much designed in such a way as to point to the Messiah. Almost one-third of the book of Genesis is about the story of Joseph, who is very much a redeemer figure pointing to the Savior. There are dozens of ways in which his life and story parallels and points forward to the true Messiah. And here's just one that I kind of like to share. At the Exodus, Pharaoh knew Israel was fleeing to the promised land because the tomb of Joseph of Ramah, and that word Ramah is equivalent to Arimathea, because the tomb of Joseph of Ramah was empty. And we have the verse there in Exodus 13. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you. Pharaoh was aware of that. So when he saw that the bones were taken, he knew something. And we can know, as we face our final Passover, that we are going to the promised land, that is heaven itself, because the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea is empty. That's just kind of a neat comparison between them. So again, let me emphasize, I'm not diminishing the importance of the Torah or or the Old Testament at all. I'm simply making the point that to put or attach undue importance, can land you in a ditch. And some people will overemphasize the New Testament. So it works the other way. There's a ditch on the other side of the road as well. Many Christians would throw out much of the Old Testament or disregard it while focusing mainly on the New Testament, and they'll refer to themselves as New Testament Christians or New New Covenant Christians or some term like that. They are the ones who would believe that the entire law is done away with and other problems. I don't think I need to say much about this, and I'm not very familiar with it anyway, but there are are people that go this way. And of course, there's failing to take the Bible as a whole. You know, if you just concentrate on individual trees, you won't see the forest. You need to take the Bible as a whole and look at the big picture, then the parts fit into place much better. It is important to realize that there is a great controversy in the universe, a controversy that started in the mind of Lucifer. While our salvation is extremely important, there is much more involved than just that. And again, pay attention to the stories. They are the evidence. 
they are what backs up the claims. Some people really like to go by impressions. I'm not saying in this that the Holy Spirit does not give us impressions or reveal things directly to us about the meaning of Scripture. Of course that happens. But primarily it comes out of the Word itself and not externally. Some people like to go by their feelings of a claim and cling to thoughts that they are especially led by the Spirit to some understanding of Scripture. What I related earlier helps with that. Yeshua himself was not revealed to the disciples before they received instruction from the Word. I like to put a big emphasis on what the Word itself says. Now, of course, that wouldn't have worked with Moses. Moses was given such things as a burning bush, but he obviously couldn't have read any of the Bible. While the revelation of truth is progressive, so it seems is Satan's ability or freedom to counterfeit truth, to impress and affect us. He did not counterfeit the first coming, but will have more freedom when it comes to the second coming. The second Corinthians were told that no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan has also studied how to affect and control as much as he can the human mind. He has found many ways to get us off track and lead us into ditches. Satan progressively afflicted Job. He started by accusing him. Then he um, did some nasty things to his uh, family and took away his possessions. Then he afflicted his body. And finally, he afflicted his mind via his helpful friends. So there's a danger of going by feeling because Satan can work on our minds. So feeling can be another ditch. And here's the last one. This is kind of a funny little word. But one definition of it is a principle that whatever I believe has no bearing on whether that belief is truth or not. Okay, what I believe has no bearing on whether something is truth or not. Or we could say it is not necessarily true just because I believe it. We can have too high an opinion of our own understanding and interpretation of Scripture. Just thinking we are right in our understanding of the Bible can be a pothole and a very dangerous one. And this, I think, applies in Revelation 3, talking of Laodicea. It says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. You know, we could all have all those negative attributes in terms of our understanding of Scripture, while we think we have it all figured out. As they walked the road to Emmaus, Yeshua helped Cleopas and his friend avoid the spiritual ditches and set a standard for us to avoid them by putting priority on Scripture. If we will use the same standard, careful study while avoiding the ditches and potholes, we will be better able to understand Scripture. So I pray that you will take note of these warnings and stay walking with Yeshua on the narrow way and stay out of those ditches.